Hey friends, welcome back to the Thrive and Align Healing Podcast, episode 53. This is the three-part series. This is part number two in our three-part series about processing emotion and how unprocessed emotion physiologically impacts the body and the brain. Um, so last episode, we talked about neurotransmitters, hormones, and um, kind of laid the foundation. And then this week, Dr. Carmen is going to dive into some more of it. <laughs> I don't even know. So we're going to go a little bit deeper. So we, we did the introduction, right, of our neurotransmitters. Mm-hmm. And so um, I just introduced a handful of neurotransmitters. Know that there are um, hundreds of neurotransmitters also could be considered neuropeptides or neurotransmitters and neuropeptides that are all chemical signals, right? Um, that move throughout our body and throughout our brain um, when we experience emotions. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're just kind of looking at that or outlining like the tip of the iceberg, really. Okay. <laughs> um, so what happens when we experience that emotion or that feeling? is that we've got um, a release of a signal, right? That signal is um, uh, that part of that chemical signal, but it also is an electrical signal, okay? So when I say electrical signal, um, it's electrical because it has ions in it, right? Like we've heard of negative and positive ions. Um, And so as that moves throughout our body, it moves down these highways called, um, or the movement is called synapses that move along the neurons, okay? Um, And then for specifically in our brain for neurotransmitters, they come upon what we call a presynaptic terminal. um, And then there's a cleft, and then there is a postsynaptic terminal. And when that signal hits the presynaptic terminal, inside there is where the neurotransmitters are um, produced and packaged in these vesicles. So that um, signal comes, it depolarizes, which means it changes the positive and the negative ions. It opens up channels that usually involve sodium, potassium, or calcium. Um, calcium is our biggest one. It depolarizes and then it sends um, that depolarization uh, opens up those vesicles. So then when they get to the cleft, it releases the neurotransmitters right into that cleft and then it goes to the post synaptic terminal um, to continue on um, to the next uh, neuron. Okay. So translate that to like normal people. Okay. So <laughs> So when we experience a feeling, right, um, and it releases those neurotransmitters, every feeling um, is sending a signal. Every signal is releasing, like, think of it as like a pocket of uh, neurotransmitters, right? So like you have a small little pocket and it's released every time you experience that feeling. Okay. So it's like a bus station. Let's do like a, like, cause you call it a terminal and I think of a bus station. Okay. The yes. Station houses and creates all the little buses. Yes. Right? And then there's this like response. It's a magnet sort of, um, it, polarization sort of, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, comes, it depolarizes it. So it opens the doors. Yep. And all these, and they go off the cleft to the other one yes so you think of all those passengers on the bus would be like the neurotransmitters right so they release they receive this signal the bus comes into the terminal opens the door all the people exit the bus and then they get on another bus or sorry then they um go in the bus terminal if you will right um so every time you're sending a signal that's a new bus every time right so if people are in a chronic um state you're releasing the you're opening up those buses and letting those passengers off over and over and over again right new buses new passengers um so the terminal can get crowded right the terminal can get crowded um and so what what you think of those neurotransmitters are those passengers as each one of them have 
a key in hand, right? And they're going to unlock a door. Well, when that bus terminal is crowded with people, there are gonna be a lot more people or neurotransmitters available than doors to open. Okay. Okay. So our brain is changing all the time. Okay. Um, so we can change the receptors or those doors depending on whether there's too many people in that terminal or if there's not enough. Okay. Okay. Now, um, if we have, so if we have constant uh, neurotransmitters being released in that um, space, then your body doesn't want to waste things. So what it may do is it may produce more receptors so that it can use more of those neurotransmitters. Okay. Okay. Now the trick is the same thing can happen if there, if you're, um, if you don't have enough passengers or if you don't have enough neurotransmitters and your brain is kind of starving for them or your body's starving for them it will still produce more receptors so that what is produced and released um can open more doors <clears throat> okay i lost you so either way our body's producing more doors, whether there's a plethora of passengers or a scarcity of passengers. Yes, it's an adaptive feature. Yes. Why would it Why would it pr produce more doors when there's not very many passengers? Um, because it wants to maximize the amount or maximize the uh, use of the neurotransmitters that are produced. Okay. Right. Okay, so it's like, hey, so if there's only 10 passengers on the bus instead of 50, it's mm -hmm. like, hey, we want to make sure that we, all 10 of them have a door to open. We'll just produce a ton of doors so at least all 10 can get unlocked. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now long term, when you have a flood of neurotransmitters or a flood of people in the bus terminal, all right, your body, your um, body and your brain is going to take advantage of that and make more doors. But then over time, it will begin, it'll say, okay, we're, it's too much, right? So that um, adaptation then changes and then it'll start to take some of those doors away. Okay. Okay. Um, because it's trying to balance that because um, uh, it thinks it's, when our body says, okay, this is a short term surge, let's use it. Um, but then if it's constantly being um, bombarded by all those excess neurotransmitters, it will down regulate, it's what they call down regulating receptors, or it will begin to take some of those away. Okay. Okay. Um, at the beginning, that increase of receptors or those doors, that's what happens when um, we have, uh, like when people become, uh, who are smokers, people who become addicted to nicotine, um, our body creates new, what we call nicotinic receptors to use that excess um, uh, exposure to nicotine, right? Because our body uses nicotinic receptors. So this is kind of unique in smoking, but um, nicotine, the main, one of the main products in, um, uh, cigarettes, uh, stimulates those nicotinic receptors in our brain. So at the beginning, um, we have, our body produces more of those nicotinic receptors or more of those doors, right? So that every time we're smoking, we're like stimulating all those receptors. So then when people stop smoking and they cut back, those nicotinic receptors then are like starving because they're used to being stimulated all the time. Mm -hmm. And then that triggers those cravings. Okay. Okay. So that's just an example of how that works. And then as, um, yeah, uh, people stop smoking uh, that, that transition is, um, or that receptors are transient. So then they can begin to downregulate because they're not needed as much. Okay. Okay. So, Let's see, where was I going that? So I wanted to, to express the, the um, pliability of the receptors, right? Um, depending on uh, how our body produces those, not how, but how much neurotransmitters our body produces. And these neurotransmitters are produced either by our thoughts, is that? 
Uh, yes. There's and then yeah. also chemicals like drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, food. Um, let's see. So I can't say that they're all produced by those things, but they're influenced by those things. Yes. Okay. Our thoughts yeah. create them. Yes. And then how does smoking? So smoking doesn't make the neurotransmitters. It changes the receptors. Okay. Um, yeah. Chemicals are on the receptor end. Thoughts are yeah. on the creation end. Yes. Yeah. Now a lot of prescriptions and medications and even drugs can deplete our neurotransmitters. Um, blocking them. Yes. Okay. Okay. So does that part make sense? Just to me. Okay. So hopefully I didn't lose you guys. So we're changing. So I just really wanted to emphasize that those receptors can be upregulated or downregulated depending okay. on um, if there's an excess of a certain neurotransmitter. Okay. Now we introduced some of those neurotransmitters and neuropeptides last episode, um, but know that they are usually divided into two different groups, the excitatory and the inhibitory um, okay. neurotransmitters. So we would think the excitatory are those that, you know, excite uh, those signals. Um, those are the things we talked about last week, like the norepinephrine, the epinephrine, um, what did I talk to you guys about it? Oh, like the adrenaline, I think. Yeah, we called it um, uh, dopamine, um, oxytocin. Uh, I don't know that I introduced glutamate last time, but glutamate's also considered excitatory. Um, the inhibitory ones are things like GABA, um, serotonin, dopamine can also be considered inhibitory. Um, so we have a balance, right? Our body's always trying to balance between um, those two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, if we go into the chemistry, right? So we're talking about, so far, we're kind of talking about biopsychology and we're going to marry biopsychology, which is the biological physiology part of our brain with the psychology part, which is our emotions. Now we're going to marry that with the biochemical part of our brain. Okay. So when I want you to think of these neurotransmitters, they are um, uh, neutral to a certain extent, but they are made of, of chemical components, right? They're molecules. So they've got hydrogens, um, nitrogens, oxygen, carbon um, uh, bound together um, to produce these molecules for neurotransmitters. Okay. Um, so for research purposes, we're going dis to di distinguish positive and negative emotions. Okay. okay. So I want to make sure that I'm distinguishing this for as a um, being, I always get these mixed up, objective. Yes. Objective. As far as positive and negative emotions go, right? Because we've talked about, um, maybe not in our podcast, but we've, we've talked about shadow work that positive and negative emotions are um, on a spectrum, but as far as research purposes go, if we put the positive emotions together, things like the um, love, appreciation, confidence, peace, happiness, um, those create a different biochemical reaction okay. than the negative emotions. So anger, resentment, pain, fear, grief, anxiety, disappointment, that classification of emotions create a different biochemical reaction. Okay. okay. So what we're starting to see is that um, those on the positive side um, are usually what we consider positive, right, um, are more on the alkalizing side which means that they are, the molecule structure is a little bit more positive, okay? So we're talking about chemistry here versus those on the negative side um, are the more, okay, I see where this could get confusing. Negative or classifying, right? Objectively as negative emotions also create um, negative molecules, which makes it more polar. Um, and then that is more acidic. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
uh, on the, so um, acidity is when the pH is less than seven, okay? And so we're talking about um, acidity within the extracellular space. So if people wonder, well, when they draw blood, right, they tell me that my blood, that our blood can't be acidic, it has to be neutral. Um, if we're looking at the extracellular space, um, that isn't what's tested on our blood. This is what's tested like in our urine or saliva for acidity. Okay. And um, an acidic state creates disease. Because it's a high inflammation state as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, our increased acidity uh, looks like things um, increases uh, like premature aging, right? Um, inflammation, um, cancer, chronic illness, chronic disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we're thinking from our, th from our thoughts, right. right? Our thoughts and our feelings, if they have a tendency to be on the more negative side, um, then the negative emotions, well, that creates molecules that are more polar or more negative, more acidic. Okay. okay. What we do see is that that increased acidity activates the amygdala, right? We've talked about the amygdala being in the reptilian brain, right? Or the primal brain. Mm -hmm. And so the more activated our amygdala is, um, the, uh, more, no, the longer our body's in a chronic fight or flight stage, mm -hmm. state, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like it has that, uh, the more negative ions that are in there, the more, um, polarized it is, the more likely it will be to be triggered, um, to be in that sympathetic state. Okay. Yeah, so then I'm thinking from a coaching thought work perspective, when we're triggering that amygdala or the primal brain, yeah. um, from coaching, we talk about that that part of our brain has three agendas. Agenda one, seek pleasure. Seek agenda two, avoid pain. Three is utilize as little energy as possible. And it's also the area that's like instant gratification, mm -hmm. right? So if we're triggering that part of our brain, then we're not able to um, upgrade into our prefrontal cortex. Exactly. To, You're creating this. To yeah. execute our goals, to delay gratification. We're just staying in this very, um, I love analogies, right? Because I'm a very visual person. We're staying in this very like primal animalistic state, which is like right in the moment, live in the moment, survive, seek pleasure, i.e. food, right? whatever makes us feel good because we're only living in the moment. So no wonder when we're in this negative thought loop, we can't get the results we want. It's because we're constantly physiologically chemistry and biologically we're staying in this very low brain state. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah. You're creating this, uh, this loop, right. Um, of experience um, because the th thoughts and emotions are creating a chemical pool, if you will, um, within that amygdala that makes it um, easily triggered. Yep. So then you're constantly, yeah, um, in that loop. Okay. And so um, for, so when people follow like an alkaline diet, right? Where they're eating more vegetables, more greens, um, even maybe drinking alkaline water, trying to avoid those inflammatory foods like red meats and um, alcohol and caffeine and um, processed foods. And they still have uh, chronic illness or they still have disease. We got to look at emotions, right? Because your emotions are creating that acidity. So even if you may have a really clean diet, um, your body needs that clean diet to help keep up, um, with that acidity that we're creating on our own, right? It's not necessarily coming from an outside, um, exposure. It's yeah. coming from within. Yeah. 
Okay. So my thought is then, uh, I always, I hope it's helpful for you guys all, for me to use myself as an example. <laughs> so people like me that are, we exercise, right? I, I don't drink caffeine. I drink water and tea. Um, I eat pretty healthy. I don't eat a lot of processed foods, but I still don't feel like I'm that healthy. Like I don't feel good a lot. Like I should, I feel like what you're telling me is it's because <laughs> of your brain and your emotions. Because I think there's a lot of people like me that are doing check checking all the boxes. Like we're doing all the things, but I still don't feel good. Yeah. And yeah. basically your message is it's because of your brain and your thoughts. Is that it? It yeah, it is. It's just it's on so those thoughts are creating, right? Those chemical reactions. Right. So from chemistry perspective um it's hard to feel good when you've got yeah this when you're not addressing the, the thoughts and the feelings that are associated with that yeah yeah so uh, okay. so even though our thoughts and feelings are on a spectrum right um and so i wanted to make sure and emphasize this because i didn't want since we classify in science and in research as positive and negative emotions because they create those chemical reactions, um, that biochemistry, mm -hmm. um, even though, and even though those emotions are on a spectrum, right? And everybody experiences all of them, we can directly fluctuate um, within that spectrum. If we're more on the positive side, that's more the alkalizing. So those are more um, positive ions, right? Um, so that creates that higher pH, the pH that's above seven, um, which is a healthier state that our body would like to be in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. Um, perfect. So this is another reason why you see, so we know, like, um, I want to talk about like premature aging um, and stress, right? This is why people see pictures of the president at the beginning of the presidency. And then like four, eight years in, they look almost like a whole nother person, right? Like they've premature age. And we always think of that. Well, that's stress. It is stress, but specifically it's those that acidic state because of those negative ions, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's created because of the increased cortisol, the increased um, neurotransmitters that are associated with that. Um, uh, stress, right? Like that pain, that fear, that grief, that disappointment, that, um, that side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, um, we all experience um, physical changes due to our emotions. We just don't always register that that's where it's connected. Um, yeah, so hopefully this is kind of giving um, an opportunity to kind of look behind the curtain to say, oh, okay, um, it makes a little bit more sense as to why I'm doing all the healthy things that are good for my body, but I don't, I'm not, I don't quite feel like I'm there yet. Yeah. yeah. It's like, this is, you know, um, something we need to address to try and feel that, um, address that gap, if you will. Well, then this can explain, because there's people I know that are like, not as healthy as me, yeah. right? Like they don't exercise as much and they don't eat as healthy as diet as I like to think I do. And like, they are healthier than me. Like they bounce back. They don't get sick as much. Right. But they're also like, not as type A as me. They're just yeah. a little bit more laid back and like happy. So that's that's bridging the gap. It's yes. Yeah. Their emotional state is making up for the lack of action line state, the, the diet and the exercise. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because people, um, doctors will theorize, you know, hey, if you are in a chronic um uh, negative emotional state and creating all this acidity, you would be, and you weren't healthy or you weren't making the right choices with food or, an, you know, more of an alkaline diet, you would be in a much more chronic disease state than you are. Right. Yeah. Um, because those making those healthier choices in lifestyle, um, is 
trying to outweigh right um, the negative ions that are um, occurring because of our emotions and our feelings. I just had this amazing thought. I love my brain sometimes. So in fitness and owning a gym, I used to, we used to tell our members right like you cannot outwork a bad diet, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You like cannot come into a gym and do an hour workout and make up for seven thousand calories a day weekend. Right. Like just you're telling me it's the same thing. <laughs> you cannot out healthy lifestyle negative thoughts. Right. They have to go hand in hand. Yeah. I have a similar thing that I tell people you can't out supplement a bad diet. Yeah. Right. People will, I mean, they want to come in, they just want supplements. They may, you know, want to spend hundreds of dollars on supplements, or they may come in with an entire bag or two bags full of supplements I'm like this is a lot of and this is an investment this is a lot of money um but they're not getting results Mm -hmm. so we have to look at the whole person the whole picture right it's not just lifestyle it's not just (laughs) our supplements and our exercise and nutrition it's also our thoughts right yeah um it's our thoughts and those feelings and addressing those emotions um we've talked about the power of the mind um this is just looking at it from more of a chemical biochemical state and like looking at the chemistry mm-hmm. of uh, how things change yeah so good. i mean <laughs> what else do you have to impart to us <laughs> so okay um so I wanted to kind of outline that and help make sure that that hopefully makes sense. Okay, so some of the things um, that are not as internal that are, you know, external. So we're talking about diet, lifestyle, we're talking about um, our emotions, but we also, and I, I'm just gonna reiterate these kind of quickly because we I feel like we've talked about these a lot, but um, that, you know, we see those interactions between um, our stress, right? Depleting our neurotransmitters. Um, as far as diet goes, we do know that there are specific things like caffeine, alcohol, artificial sweeteners that inhibit the production of neurotransmitters. And also if we are not um, providing our body with those building blocks or those amino acids, almost all of our neurotransmitters, the backbone is an amino acid or our neuropeptides. So making sure that we have a balanced diet with those amino acids, either from plant proteins or from lean, healthy animal proteins um, is essential just to have the building blocks so our body can produce um, those neurotransmitters. So for example, like serotonin, we've talked about um, the main building block for serotonin is tryptophan. Right. So if we don't and we've heard about tryptophan, especially around like turkey, um, the uh, season Thanksgiving, (laughs) um, because everybody thinks that turkey makes them so sleepy because of that tryptophan. Um, Well, it's also, you know, helps to produce serotonin if we don't have a lot of tryptophan um, available. And then uh, digestion. So if we have poor digestion, then our body cannot absorb those amino acids or break them down in our foods so that we can um, assimilate them to produce these neurotransmitters. Okay. So um, I think way back, we talked about the gut brain connection. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we're talking about these neurotransmitters, they are, there are neurotransmitters produced in our brain and there are neurotransmitters produced all over our body. Okay. In the gut, we have over 300 neurons um, that we know are, that they've identified or mapped out. Um, so we know that the relationship between the neurotransmitters produced in our gut is directly related to what's produced in our brain. Right. So if our gut's not producing enough, then we're not getting enough in our brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, as far as like toxins and environmental stuff, we do know like exposure to heavy metals um, not only damages our brain tissue, but reduces our neurotransmitter production mm-hmm. um, and alters our serotonin production. Pesticides, we've seen this. Um, pesticides on our foods, if we don't wash them off or try to neutralize them or don't buy organic, that can also lower our serotonin production. Um, And then, oh, um, prescriptions, right? So we know that there's a lot of prescriptions, especially in the psychology world, that are, are produced to manipulate our neurotransmitters, 
Okay. Most of them, can I say this? The majority of them are produced to in not increase the production of neurotransmitters, but increase the length of time they stay in that cleft or the length of time they stay between when they get off the bus and before they get into the bus terminal, right? Um, so they can let more into the bus terminal. Um, so, but there are prescriptions out there that can actually lower our neurotransmitter production, right? Mostly things that have to do with fats because neurotransmitters have that amino acid backbone, but they also have a fatty acid backbone. So a lot of the cholesterol medication can lower the production of our neurotransmitters. So sometimes people may have a change in mood after they start cholesterol medications, especially young people. If um, uh, you have like a family history of cholesterol, high cholesterol and your doctor wants to put you on cholesterol medication because, you know, at like 30, 20, and your 40s, um, know that that can change your mood. And sometimes there's not that direct relationship or people don't always see that direct relationship. Um, so know that uh, there is one. Yeah. Um, those are kind of the big things that I wanted to introduce because um, next week we're gonna talk about <laughs> what you can do at home. <laughs> Um, to not only just like boost your neurotransmitter production, but you know, to, to kind of balance them out a little bit, right? Um, to make sure that you're providing those optimal building blocks um, to creating, you know, um, different thought patterns so that we can um, address our overall health um, by looking at the neurotransmitter side. Yay. <laughs> that was really great. Yeah, hopefully that wasn't too much. <laughs> People are like, I was getting what she was saying. And then the other lady brought in all this confusion with bus stops and buses. But I was like, okay, so we have this terminal where they're produced and then the cleft. Yes, yeah. And then there's another, right? And that's where they're traveling to. Exactly, exactly, yeah. No, I mean, it makes sense. That was a great um, analogy or metaphor. Have you ever been to a bus station? It, yeah, that's exactly, um, or it's very similar to what we experience between those uh, neurons in those um, synaptic clefts. So that works. Hopefully um, that makes sense. If you guys have any questions, reach out to us and email us and we'll try to explain it better. Because, well, let's just do like the synapses are like these, like they're not connected. There's a gap between There's them. That's the cleft. Right. Exactly. Right. Yes. So this one produces it. It goes to the cleft and it jumps over to the other yes. one. It's yeah. The, the anatomy of the biology. Would that be the right way of saying that? Yes. Yeah. It's the structural, yeah, anatomy within the, yeah. the, um, the brain. Yeah. And those neurons, well, I should say the entire nervous system. Yeah. Because, yeah. Those are the same signaling pathways you use all the way to our fingers and toes. Right. So from our sensory to our motor um, pathway. So our sensory, right, you touch something and it's hot. That signal has to go to, uses the same neurons, right? Goes to our brain, says, hey, that's hot. Then the motor comes down and says, hey, I should remove my hand off of that yeah. object. Yeah. So then, sorry, I know we were wrapping up. Uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about neurons that fire together, wire together. Yes. So that, what does that mean? So that is what we've talked about, um, our highways, yeah. right? Um, is it, that's that neuroplasticity. So when your neurons are firing together, um, it becomes auto automated, if you will, and it creates that uh, highway, right? Or that interstate. Um, so then when you wanna change your thought process, right? You engage different neurons and it's like you're taking a machete and you're creating a path, a new trail um, down here on this side. Uh, then the more you work on that thought pattern and that thought process, you create neurons that fire together and create a new neuro neural pathway or a new highway, if you will. Okay. And so that's why it's important to know that like because our primal brain does not like to use very much energy. It likes to conserve energy. Yes. So when we have a belief, a belief is thoughts that you've had over and over again, 
right? which we just created neurons that fire together. They've wired together. It's a preferential thought pattern. Yeah. It's very easy. It's automated, right? So our yeah. brain, um, I think that's the point in thought, like coaching is like, we're never going to fully get rid of like a lot of us struggle with worthiness. Okay. Um, we're never fully going to get rid of that because that is a belief system, a neurological pathway that's fired together, wired together very easy to access right yeah. so you can never fully get rid of it i don't think i think it's just like a highway that's there but we create a new pathway a new highway that serves us better um and those then start firing together and eventually they'll wire together right and create a new pathway but then yeah. this other one just kind of becomes this abandoned one that we can still access but we just kind of see it as like, oh yeah, right? Yes, you're like, yeah, you can recognize, okay, that used to be the highway, right? But I'm going to choose to go this direction. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. That's, I mean, we're describing what they call neuroplasticity um, in the, uh, I guess, science world. Yeah, um, but yes, by knowing that, right, hopefully creates an opportunity and helps to empower people to say, okay, you know, now I, I can recognize that thought process when something, uh, when I'm reactive um, to a particular situation or scenario or, yeah, comment, um, and then I get to choose which highway do I want to um, pursue, yeah. right, yeah, and when it creates those feelings. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. That's all I got. All right. All right. Well, um, let's call it a day and we will pick up next week and learn a little bit more of the um, what you can do to support those neurotransmitters um, and um, address those thought patterns. Yay. All right. We'll see you next week, humans. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.